Welcome to the fourth video in my Bleach review series, and in this video we're covering my favourite portion of the Bleach story, which is the Arunka invasion of Karakura Town, which serves as the first section of the Arunka arc. In this story arc, we are introduced to several new concepts in the form of Arunkas and Vizards. Through the Arunkas, we are introduced to a brand new group of characters called the Espada, and of course, through the Vizards, we are introduced to Hirako Shinji and his group of Vizards. I love this story arc because we return to the familiar and environment of Karakura Town. This urban setting is disrupted by the arrival of the rebellious Arunka, who effectively spray paint Karakura Town with their spiritual pressure. There are three waves in which the Arunka invade Karakura Town. The first involving Yami and Ukiora, the second being the unauthorized invasion by Grimjao and his Frashion, while we know that the third and final invasion by the Arunka serves as a diversion, distracting Ichigo and the others while allowing Ukiora to intercept Orihime and to threaten her. So with all of this external conflict going on, Ichigo 2 is dealing with an internal conflict of his own. We had brief glimpses of Ichigo's inner hollow during the Soul Society arc, but during this arc his inner hollow returns and tries to assume control over Ichigo. Ichigo is unable to fight and to protect his loved ones because of the disruptions of his inner hollow, the same inner hollow that he had rejected during his battle against Byakuya. During this portion of the story we learn that Ichigo isn't going to be able to get rid of his inner hollow so easily, so while also combating the threat of the Arankars, Ichigo has to find a way to overcome his fear of his inner hollow and to subdue it so that he remains in control. As you already know, I love this portion of the story, and with all of these story beats simultaneously unfolding, there is plenty to discuss. So without further delay, let's get into my analysis of the first third of the Arunka arc, the Arunka invasion of Karakura Town. Before the video begins, only 20% of the people who actually watch my content are subscribed to the channel. If you enjoy these videos, then subscribe and stick around for more content just like this. Now let's get back to the topic of the video. The Arunka invasion takes place between episodes 110 to 142, with a fair few of these episodes being filler episodes, and in the manga it takes place between chapters 183 to 240. So in this video we're going to be covering about 58 chapters worth of material. At the onset of this story arc, Kubo makes us familiar with a couple of new concepts, the first being Vizards, who are Shinigami that have obtained hollow powers, and the second being Arunkas, who are hollows that have gained Shinigami powers. We learn about Vizards through the introduction of Shinji Hirako, who reveals to Ichigo that he too has a holo mask and a Zanpakuto. He desires to recruit Ichigo into his group called the Vizards, while at the same time we learn about Arankas through the reintroduction of the Grand Fisher into the story, as he has removed his holo mask and gained Shinigami powers, transforming him into an Aranka. Learning about the Vizards is pivotal for us to understand how Ichigo controls his holo powers, so at this point in the story it would be fair to assume that Ichigo is also a Vizard, and also learning about the Arankas is pivotal in understanding the army of Arankas that Aizen is building, and especially his elite Aranka soldiers, which are referred to as the Espada. So when the Grand Fisher reappears as an Aranka, he is defeated by Ichigo's father Ishin, who is revealed to also be a Shinigami, while at the same time Uryu was dealing with an Aranka of his own. But of course, after having lost his Quincy abilities, this proves to be far more difficult, and he ends up being saved by his father Ryuken, who we learn is able to utilize Quincy abilities despite him denouncing his Quincy nature. Not too long after after this, Karakura Town is invaded by the first batch of Aizen's Aranka. The two Aranka that arrive are of course Yami and Ukiora. In a scene that is reminiscent to the arrival of Vegeta and Nappa during the Saiyan arc, Yami begins to immediately cause havoc to his surroundings, while the menacing but yet smaller in stature Ukiora remains silent and observes. Chad and Orihime are the first to intercept the Espada, but their efforts prove to be futile as Yami gravely injures Chad, and when Ichigo appears to protect them, his efforts are also proven to be be futile, and this is thanks to the sudden interruption by his inner hollow. When Ichigo refuses assistance from his inner hollow, it begins to fight back, causing him to be distracted and thus being badly beaten by Yami. He too is then rescued by the arrival of Urahara and Yuriichi, who are able to successfully fend off the Espada. We learn that Ukiara and Yami had appeared within Karakura Town for a simple reconnaissance mission. They were ordered to evaluate the threat that Ichigo had posed towards Aizen. However, after having encountered and easily beaten him, they are reassured 
shot that Ichigo is not a worthy threat to Aizen and his plans. However, while in Karakura Town, something did gain the attention of Ukiara. He was able to deduce that Orihime's abilities are far more than just the ability to heal. He states that she has the power to reverse time, and thus she is able to return an object or a person to a prior state in time. She is able to manipulate space and time itself. This interest that Ukiara expresses towards Orihime's abilities foreshadows her being taken to Huekomundo, as her powers are unlike anything that Ukiara has seen before, and he believes that her powers could assist Aizen in some way. The fact that Ichigo was unable to protect his friends deeply impacts him, and despite him being there, he was unable to prevent Orihime from being hurt, and this was all because of the interruptions from his inner hollow. He begins to be fearful that this hollow that resides within him is going to take over, and he doesn't know how to control or subdue it. This proves to be a considerable source of inner conflict for Ichigo's character here. He remains in a slump until Team Hitsugaya arrives within Karakura Town. Captain Hitsugaya leads a team consisting of Renji Abarai, Ikaku Madarame, Yumi Chika, Rangiku, and lastly Rukia. Rukia notices that Ichigo is sulking, and after pulling him to one side and giving him a pep talk, he is able to get back onto his feet, and is prepared for battle when Grimjao and his Frashion invade Karakura Town without the permission of Aizen. They each take part in their own separate battles, with the most significant fight during this portion of the story occurring between Ichigo and Grimjao. A key revelation that takes place during this series of battles is the reveal of Ikaku's Bankai. It is probably one of the worst kept secrets of the entire Bleach series, but it's something that Ikaku doesn't want to be known widely, as he has no interest for pursuing a higher position within the Gotei 13, as he desires to grow stronger under the watchful eye of his captain Kimpachi Zaraki, a man who he had come to admire and respect after being defeated by him. So with Team Hitsugaya initially appearing to be struggling against Grimjar's Frashion, they end up receiving permission from the Soul Society to remove the limiter that has been placed upon their power, and after doing so, the Shinigami are easily able to defeat the Iranka. Meanwhile, Ichigo is losing his battle against Grimjao. However, after being badly beaten, he is able to fire a Getsuga Tensho towards Grimjao, which scars him. Before the fight can continue, it is interrupted by the arrival of Kaname Tozen, as he brings Grimjao back to Huekomundo, where he is punished for taking action without permission, as he has his arm severed by Tozen. At the conclusion of this fight, Ichigo is once again devastated, as he was unable to protect Rukia, and this deeply impacts him. He realizes, because of his inner hollow desiring to take control over him, he is unable to battle. So after he had initially rejected Chinji's proposal of help, at this point he has no choice but to turn to the Vizards, who end up assisting Ichigo by taking him into his inner world, where he battles his inner hollow, defeating it and taking control over his being. The Vizards then teach Ichigo how to manifest his hollow abilities in battle, through extending the period of time that Ichigo can manifest his hollow mask in battle. During this time, Chad feels like he is being left behind, so he seeks help from Urahara, who instructs him to train with Renji, so that the two of them can grow stronger together. And meanwhile, Uryu begins training with his father, in the hopes of regaining his lost Quincy powers. While everybody is training, we learn about the true intentions of Aizen from Head Captain Yamamoto, as he explains to Hitsugaya and his team that Aizen desires to kill everybody in Karakura Town, as it is an area enriched with spiritual energy. He desires to do so so that he can create the Oken, which is a key to enter into the Soul King's domain. And this is because Aizen ultimately wants to overthrow the Soul King, deeming the Soul King to be unfit to rule over reality, and believing that he could do a better job. Orihime also begins a training with Rukia and the Soul Society, as the two of them get stronger and prepare for the upcoming battle against Aizen and his army in the winter. Everybody's training ends up being cut short with the third invasion of the Aranka within Karakura Town. The four Aranka, Grimjao, Yami, Lupi, and Wonderwise arrive. They serve as a distraction for Ichigo and the others, while Ukiara is able to intercept Orihime. During Ichigo's rematch against Grimjao, he is able to use his newly acquired Hollow Mask. He has the upper hand during the battle, that is, until the Hollow Mask breaks. The tables turn as Grimjao begins to once again soundly beat Ichigo, and he ends up being saved by the arrival of Shinji and Rukia. And as we know, when Ukiara speaks to Orihime, he orders her to come to Huekomundo, otherwise he threatens to kill her friends. He ends up giving her 24 hours to say goodbye to one person, who of course ends up being Ichigo. In this moment, she confesses her true love for him, and states that even if she was reborn five times, she would fall in love with the same person. After this, she is then taken to Huekomundo. She does so, so that she can protect her friends. And we later learn, during the Huekomundo portion of this story, that Orihime was devising for a way to disrupt Aizen's plans with her abilities. She had wanted to 
destroy the Hokyoku with their powers. This is important to mention because it's a distinction between the way that Rukia was taken to the Soul Society and the way that Orihime had chosen to go to Huekomundo. Rukia had no choice, while Orihime had made the decision to go there. But again, I'll talk more about the differences between the Huekomundo arc and the Soul Society arc in the next video of my Bleach review series. But for now, Orihime leaving for Huekomundo is interpreted by Head Captain Yamamoto as her betrayal. He forbids Ichigo from going to Huekomundo to rescue her. But of course, Ichigo disobeys these orders, because after all, his priority is to protect his friends. He seeks help from Urahara, who is more than willing to open up a garganta for him to enter into Huekomundo. While at Urahara's shop, he meets Chad and Uryu, who prove that they too have been training and are strong enough to assist Ichigo, with Chad having learned a new ability called El Directo, and with Uryu not only having regained his Quincy powers, but he has also learned several new abilities from his father. So with the three of them ready, Urahara opens up the garganta, and they enter into Huekomundo, thus concluding the Aranka invasion of Karakura Town, and taking us into the Huekomundo portion of this story. So one of the important things that I want to speak about is Ichigo's frame of mind during these chapters of the story. The Aranka arc features Ichigo at his most vulnerable, and it's a stark contrast to his attitude during the Soul Society arc, and I believe that this shift in his character that occurs is too jarring for a lot of people to accept. But try to imagine how Ichigo is feeling. His mother had been killed by a hollow, so initially his fear of hollows had developed into resentment. He hates hollows because his mother was killed by a hollow. This is why he rejects assistance from his inner hollow at every occasion. It isn't until he starts to train with the Vizards that he begins to utilize the powers of his inner hollow. But even at this point, he hasn't accepted this part of himself. Quite simply, at this point in the story, Ichigo hates the hollow nature of his abilities, and gradually with time, he comes to learn that he is unable to subdue his inner hollow. He is fearful that it's going to take over him. And what are the consequences of this? The ultimate consequence of his inner hollow taking over is that his friends and family will be hurt. This fear proves to be true when Ichigo transforms into that Vasto Lore form, and he ends up impaling Uryu during the fake Karakura Town arc, but that's something that we'll talk about later. The issue that Ichigo currently has with his inner hollow is that if it takes over, then he will be unable to protect his loved ones, or he will have difficulty doing so. His inner hollow attempts to manifest during his battle against Yami. This ends up distracting him, which results in him being unable to protect Orihime. His subsequent fear of his inner hollow results in him not being able to properly battle against Grimjao, which leads to Rukia being injured by Grimjao. This ends up being the breaking point, which leads the stubborn Ichigo to eventually accept the help of the Vizards. At the start, when Shinji had offered help to Ichigo, he had adamantly stated that he isn't one of them. He identified himself as a Shinigami, completely rejecting an integral part of Ichigo's inner powers. And if you've read the entirety of the Bleach story, then you're going to be aware of how integral his inner hollow is to his abilities. Without being able to accept this part of himself, Ichigo will not be able to grow stronger, and thus keep up with the ever-increasing threat that is being presented to him. This external conflict is of course Aizen's army of Aranka. Why is it that I love this portion of the story so much? It's because Ichigo doesn't have a single victory in this arc, aside from his victory over his inner hollow where he enters his inner world. He is able to subdue his inner hollow, and is thus able to momentarily prove that he is the king, while hollow Ichigo is the horse that answers to him. This is excellent character writing, and it plays on the idea of the self versus the self. When he is distressed, Ichigo is the type of character to turn inward. He pushes away his loved ones. He has that fake smile. The concern that he feels is written on his face. His behavior becomes more colder as his loved ones realize that he is distancing himself from them. This is all because Ichigo is afraid of his inner hollow, but in order for him to once again protect his loved ones, he has to control his inner hollow. And it is thanks to the introduction of a new character, Shinji Hiroko, and his group called the Vizards, that Ichigo is able to do so. It is Shinji who is the first person who directly tells Ichigo what is wrong with him, and what the consequences are if Ichigo doesn't do anything about it. He warns him that if Ichigo remains as a Shinigami, he will eventually be swallowed up by the Hollow. He will lose his mind, and after this, he will destroy everything. His friendships, his future, and eventually himself. Behind Shinji's strange and erratic outward appearance, he's a very serious and down-to-earth character. He was persistent with his motive to recruit Ichigo into the Vizards. What you have to remember is, Shinji and the others are getting nothing out of helping Ichigo. It is just they have come across somebody who is similar to themselves and is struggling. So out of the goodness of their heart, they want to help Ichigo. For after all, he too was a victim of Aizen's experiments, just like the Vizards were. We'll understand more about this during the Thousand Year Blood War arc, as we learn about the past of Ichigo's mother, and how she was attacked by the Hollow White, and how that incident led to the birth of Ichigo's inner hollow, which is now causing him so much trouble during this arc. While Ichigo is learning to manifest his hollow mask for a longer period of 
time, he senses that Grimjah's spiritual pressure has returned in Karakura Town. He has no choice but to let Ichigo go, despite knowing that he isn't ready to face off against an Espada. Thankfully, Shinji had followed him, and he ends up saving both Rukia and Ichigo from Grimjow, and we finally get to see this mysterious Vizard face off against my favourite newly introduced antagonist within this story. I am of course referring to Grimjow, who in some ways inherits Renji's role from the prior story arc as Ichigo's rival, and in addition to this, Grimjow has a very wild and rebellious personality, which is slightly similar to Renji's. The only difference being is that Grimjow has no self-restraint. While Renji could be reasoned with, the sixth Esparta doesn't share in this personality trait. During Shinji's battle with Grimjow, we get to see how powerful Shinji really is, as Grimjow is pushed to the point where he is about to release his Zanbakdo, until he is stopped by Ukiara and taken back to Huekomundo. Despite the fact that Grimjow had the upper hand against Ichigo, when he returns to Huekomundo, he is very much the underdog of that area. In some ways, he is fighting to prove himself, and this should be evident from the second invasion of the Aranka, which Grimjow had led without the permission of Aizen. This is because Grimjow desires to prove his strength, and he does so by destroying anybody who dares to get in his way. I love Grimjow because he is a well-written character, one that Kubo has fleshed out and continues to add to him through the Huekomundo portion of the story, where we learn about Grimjow's backstory. But for now, during the Aranka invasion, it is evident that Grimjow has a superiority complex. He believes that he is better than everybody, aside from one person, which is of course Aizen. When Ichigo's character is really down and out, Grimjow's character appears to push him even further into despair. By attacking Rukia and then mercilessly beating him down, it solidifies the role of a rival that Grimjow plays within the story. His first battle against Ichigo leaves us with a lasting impression, and from here on out, Grimjow becomes a memorable character, one that we really cannot wait to see again. At least that was the case for me. Grimjow eventually ends up holding a grudge against Ichigo after their first battle, because Ichigo was able to successfully land a Getsuka Tensho against him, which ends up scarring Grimjow. This scar serves to permanently remind Grimjow of the individual who had dared to challenge him. It is safe to say that a lot of us fell in love with Grimjow's character after seeing the anime adaptation of their first fight, where he repeatedly punches Ichigo in the face while sadistically laughing. This lack of self-restraint is unlike anything that we have seen within the story so far. At least when Ichigo and the others went to the Soul Society, they had some self-restraint. The new adversaries that Ichigo and company are going to be facing off against cannot be reasoned with. In some way, they are facing off against wild animals, individuals who have no idea or sense of right and wrong. Each of the Arankars have a unique way of expressing the worst of humanity, whether if this is Grimjow feeling too full of himself, or Yami brutally hurting those weaker than him. And my favourite, which is Ukiara's nihilistic apathy. Just like the way that Kubo had introduced us to the Gote 13 during the Soul Society arc, I believe that he has done it again through the introduction of the Espada during the Aranka arc. Each of the Espada have their unique appearances, for example, like Grimjow's blue hair, which is an inversion of the colour orange, visually symbolising that he is Ichigo's rival here, and his polar opposite during this story arc, or how Ukiara has a hole within his chest to symbolise his heartlessness, and his inability to relate to those who have a heart. And after Ichigo and the others go to Huekomundo, we get to see the other Espada, and they are equally as unique as the Espada that we see during the Iranka invasion. Another memorable character who leaves a powerful impression on me after reading this portion of the story is the character of Ukiara. Now when he first arrives with Yami, he doesn't really do anything, but what he does do is comment on Yami's battle against Ichigo, and his subsequent brief altercation with Yoriichi and Urahara. Through these comments that he makes, we understand that he is a very powerful individual, and someone not to be underestimated. It's the subtlety of the way that his character is written that pulls us in and fascinates us. Aside from having a very cool and unique character design, he leaves us with a lasting impression when he defends Yami against a blast that Urahara fires towards him. We quickly begin to understand the hierarchy of the Espada, as we learn that Ukiara is more powerful than Yami, as he is able to bring the large Espada down to one knee when he scolds him and swiftly strikes him on his stomach. Ukiara proves himself through the story as one of Aizen's most loyal subjects. While following Aizen's orders to the T, sometimes his curiosity does get the better of him, as he is intrigued by the differing beliefs and opinions of others. I'll talk more about this in the next two videos that I cover of the Aranka arc, where Ukiara ends up coming face to face with Orihime's belief in the heart, and his nihilism ends up facing off against Ichigo's courage. When Ukiara confronts Orihime and follows out Aizen's orders, he gives her no choice. He is accurate and precise with his words. He tells her not to waver in the slightest and to do exactly as she is told, otherwise the lives of her friends will be on the line. And of course, Orihime will do anything to protect her friends, and by doing so, she willingly goes to Huekomundo. At the onset of this arc, when Orihime had first encountered Yami and Ukiara, she had stood up against them because she thought to herself that she was 
is always relying on Ichigo, and she doesn't want to cause Ichigo any more trouble. She is aware that Ichigo is being troubled by something, but she doesn't know what it is. So in order for him to have some peace of mind, Orihime will shoulder the burden. She will do what she can by facing off against Yami and Ukiyora so that Ichigo doesn't have to. Despite her attempt being futile and Ichigo eventually arriving to protect her, her insight into the difference that she feels in Ichigo's Reiatsu highlights to us the connection that these two characters have. Orihime is so in tune with Ichigo's spiritual pressure that she can sense the slightest disturbance in it. She describes this spiritual pressure as being different to what it was in the Soul Society arc. The Ichigo that has appeared to protect her from Yami and Ukiara has a spiritual pressure that is intense and rough. It is so dense and heavy that it is suffocating her. She feels like that the individual standing before her is a completely different Ichigo, and this change in his spiritual pressure that is so poetically described by Orihime is a result of the suffering that Ichigo must be going through that he isn't telling anybody about. During the Iranka invasion, the characters of Orihime and Chad are made to feel useless, like they are being pushed to the wayside, but despite this, they try to be proactive. Chad does so by enlisting the help of Urahara, and thus beginning his training with Renji, while Orihime does so by expressing her frustration to Rangiku that she wasn't able to cheer Ichigo up while Rukia did so effortlessly. Orihime admits here that she is jealous of Rukia, but she is reassured by Rangiku, and she proves that she isn't a petty character and she doesn't hold anything against Rukia, because later on Rukia consoles her after Urahara tells her not to get involved with the battle against Aizen and his Aranka. Rukia is there to comfort her, and she even takes Orihime to the Soul Society, where they train for an entire month. When the Aranka invade Karakura Town for the third time, Orihime rushes back from the Soul Society to help her friends. That is until she encounters Ukiara, and she is forced to help her friends in more of an indirect manner by making the ultimate sacrifice and going to Huekomundo in order to ensure their safety. He literally tells her that he is going to kill Ichigo and the others. We know that this is possible because Ukiara has demonstrated his incredible power already. Aizen desires Orihime's abilities, and it is for this reason that Ukiara has been tasked to bring Orihime unharmed. Orihime is given 12 hours to say goodbye to one person, and she is given a bracelet to wear that will conceal her spiritual pressure, so that it doesn't alert the individual that she is seeing of her presence. Now the moment that I have chosen to speak about in last is the most memorable from this section of the story, and it is of course Orihime saying goodbye to Ichigo. It is here where she finally confesses her feelings for him. Typically Kubo relies on visually conveying his story to us, through the technique of show don't tell, and he does so briefly by showing Orihime almost kiss Ichigo, but he then has her speak and cut to the chase, as Kubo directly tells us that she is in love with Ichigo, and he emphasizes this by her saying that if she were to have lived five different lifetimes, then she would have fallen in love with the same person. With Kubo being so direct in his story, it is still hard for me to believe that people didn't see Orihime and Ichigo as a pairing sooner. I mean, was it really that much of a surprise to you that after 400 chapters from this scene, the two of them ended up together? I just want to say, I love the way that this was executed, and it is once again another memorable scene in a section of the story that already has so many memorable moments, from the introduction of characters like Ukiora and Grimjao, as well as the introduction of Shinji and the Vizards, in addition to Ichigo's inner hollow delivering the iconic speech about the King and the Horse. And who can forget when Urahara arrives to protect the lieutenants when they're being attacked by Wonderwise. After rereading this portion of the story and analysing the events that occur, I still firmly believe that the Arankar invasion is one of my favourite sections of the Bleach story. And I'm not just saying this because of nostalgia. This section of the story holds up to the test of time. Unlike with every time that I reread the Bleach story, there is something new that I learn. So to wrap up with the video, now that we have covered the first portion of the Aranka arc, in the next video we will continue my review of Bleach by discussing the events that unfold within Hueco Mundo. This is of course during Ichigo's invasion of this new unexplored realm. This portion of the story is heavily criticised by fans because it feels very similar to the Soul Society arc. So in the fifth video of my Bleach review series, we will once and for all prove why the Hueco Mundo arc is not just Kubo lazily reusing ideas, but instead Kubo cleverly mirroring his past work, in order to tell us a new and unique story that has plenty of nuance for us to really dig into. So if you really think that the Hueco Mundo section of the Arankar arc is some of Kubo's weaker writing, then you are definitely going to want to check out my next video in this series. But as for the Arankar invasion, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Do you enjoy this section of the story as much as I do? Were there any moments that you liked or disliked? And if there's anything that I forgot to mention, then definitely leave a comment down below. And lastly, subscribe to the channel so that you're the first one to know when I drop my review of the Hueco Mundo arc. Thank you for making it to the end and I can't wait to see you in my next Bleach review video.
If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, then please consider supporting my channel on Patreon. I have multiple tiers with rewards including access to an exclusive Discord server, video scripts, as well as being the first to know about unreleased upcoming videos. Thank you for your time and whatever you choose to contribute, I will appreciate and it will mean a lot to me.